Oh, what's up, everybody? My name's Russ. RWGResearch.com is my website. This is video number 10 of this long series. This one's going to be, mm, I would say, one of the most important and one of the most convincing uh, for what I'm trying to tell you, and you'll see that in this video. I apologize in advance. This video is going to be pretty long. I have a book here. And I'm going to go through this entire thing. There's some, uh, uh, well, let me show you what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to read this almost as a script. I'm going to read it directly because I want to make sure I hit the points. I took a lot of time to generate this to make sure I would do and say what I wanted to do and say. So first things first, pink marker it is. Today is 11.21. Twenty seventeen and it is nine forty eight PM. Okay, like I said, it's gonna be a long video. I appreciate all of the feedback you guys gave me in the last video. If I grunt or moan or something, it's because I pulled a muscle in my back and uh decided to try to cut my thumb off. So uh yeah, and then I had another road rash incident. I've just been beating myself up lately, but you know that's okay. So I'm moving right now, but I may grunt later because I'm trying to just ignore it. So here we go. So we're going to start out with a brief thought on how magnetism is formed. All right, so what is a field basically? But we're going to go into much more detail some other video. So we're just going to scratch it today. Uh, then we're going to use the water analogy to explain something else uh, that I, that's important to this discussion. Okay, and then we're going to talk about what we currently use in mathematics to calculate the MMF or the magnetive force, okay, in a coil. And we're going to use the real world math that we understand currently right now that we use every day, right? And we're going to use that here and we're going to prove some points. This will be fun. Um, I also got a lot of quotes in here from uh, online websites that are accurate that you can double check fact, fact check, double the fact check, fact to double check, anyway. So, don't forget, you guys forgot, I didn't say this last time and then you forgot. We're not doing physics. No, we're not doing electrical engineering, we're doing physics. There might be some edits in this video because I got a lot to cover and I may edit some stuff to make sure I hit it correct. So, we are doing physics, okay? We're not doing electrical engineering per se, we're doing physics. So, one of the things that I talked about last time was what happens when you have a switch and what happens when you have an inductor and a power source. Okay, you flip it on, you flip it off. What happens if current isn't allowed to get through the, to, through the circuit? What happens there? And everyone went on, well, that can't happen. You can't have a delay and blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of people that like freaked out. But what they completely missed was I was talking about nanosecond, below like four nanosecond switching speeds. That's fast. So rethink what I was trying to say in those videos by watching them again and hearing me say nano switching uh, speeds. So anyway, I wanted to hit that a little hard because people just completely missed it. And once I tried to prove it in the comments, maybe that was a little better. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to read a lot of this because I wrote it to say it exactly how I want to say it. So here we go. Um, so this is going to be talking about what a field, uh, what, how, how a magnetic field is sort of generated. And we're just scratching it, so you can argue this, but this, this is for another conversation. The more atoms you can align for the lowest amount of power, the more efficient your system is. A permanent magnet is just that. It's an alignment of atoms. One could also say it's an electron spin alignment. But I'll just stick with atom alignment to make this easier for you guys to just understand. So I'm not going to get real deep. I'm going to keep it broad so we can talk about this stuff, even if you don't know a lot of quantum mechanics and physics and stuff like that. So spin alignment, spin alignment is where magnetism come from, uh, comes from. Even in a wire, one can look at oh, one can look up the magnetic moment for more information. Okay. So look up magnetic moment, you'll understand what I'm talking about. All right, so you only need a small amount of current to make the alignment. You only need a small amount of current to make the alignment. Then you can use voltage 
to push out the electrons from the wire, generating the field. So, um, the current acts as a catalyst to align the atoms, but the current does not participate in the release of the magnetic field, right? So current aligns the atoms, but you don't get a big magnetic field unless you push those spins out on the electrons, if you want to call it that. We are taught that the more current, the more the magnetic field. So that's what we're taught. We're taught the more current you put into a system, the bigger the magnetic field is. But current is not what makes the magnetism, okay? Current only aligns the atoms. The, volted, the voltage pushes out the field using, using pressure, okay? Okay. Ah, I'm going to say this at the very end of this discussion, so I'm not going to say this now. Um, but I'll briefly scratch it. So, okay, so we're going to talk about if you push more current into a system, you generate heat. If you generate more heat, you get less alignment of the atoms. You get more chaotic movement of the atoms. So then you have to, um, okay, so then also the reverse is true of a superconductor, right? If you cool it down, then you align all the atoms with almost no effort whatsoever. But when you generate heat, you have to put more into it to, to overcome that misalignment. So the more heat you generate, the more current you need to overcome that misalignment. That's, that's, that's what we all try to do. We push more current to make up for the losses. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about hydraulic pressure. Okay. And flow. All right. So now we're going to get into the water analogy. Now we're, now we're going to get into the water analogy. It's like water in a pipe. But this analogy only goes so far. You will see in the end that you can't compare water with electricity for many reasons, but it makes for a great mechanical analogy to get the point across. Okay, so flow. Oh man. So flow is equal to current. Okay, and pressure is equal to voltage. Okay, so that's our little that's our little diagram up there. Okay, I'm probably gonna stand in the way of it. But the point is is that voltage, okay, is uh, pressure and flow is current in this analogy. So what happens when we don't let the current through a wire? Remember? Nanosecond switching, the current can't get all the way through. What's happening there? Okay, so I talked about nano switching speeds, right? And I talked about the, um, the idea that current doesn't get all the way through the system. Um, a similar effect happens with an inductor. So what we're going to talk about right now, okay, is a pipe with a closed end, okay, with a pump pressurizing it. So we're going to talk about... I'll make it pretty long. Okay, we're going to talk about a pipe, right, with a closed end. Okay, then on this side, I'm going to fill this pipe with water. And on, on this side, all right, we're going to have a pump. I'm not going to draw, I was going to draw that, but I'm not. All right, so we have it set up like this. I'm going to draw the directionals uh, somewhere else so I can erase them easy. Okay, so we've got a pump and we've got a closed pipe. Okay, now I have to use a closed ended pipe to give you the analogy. Because what I'm trying to tell you is, is... If I can turn a coil on and off faster than it takes the current to get through it, then it acts similar to a pipe with a closed end. Okay, now hear me out before you get all huffy puffy, because <laughs> I thought this through pretty well. Okay, there will be no flow 
at the closed end, yet flow at the pump end, right? So you're gonna have, well, let's use green, I guess. So you're gonna have some flow here and basically no flow here, okay? Because it's closed pipe. Now, anywhere in between, you're gonna have a mix, right? Now, we're talking about, well, let me just read my notes because I really thought this out. Okay, however, the pressure is pushing out on the walls of the pipe. As more pressure is applied, okay, this pressure acts fast on the walls of the pipe due to the water not being compressible. So it's non-compressible, right? So it's automatically gonna start pushing on all directions of this pipe on the inside. So let us call this pipe expandable. See, now this is where most people are gonna get confused. If this is a hydraulic effect, then you can't do anything here. Once you push it in here, you build up pressure, but pressure is force in all directions, right? So if this was a flexible pipe, okay, not the cap, we'll just talk about this way. Okay, so now I'm gonna draw a cross section of the pipe. So this is like you're looking down the pipe, right? Right, and there's water in here. Now, what's gonna be happening is you're gonna have force. All right, against the edges of the pipe. Okay, so you're gonna have force against the edges of a pipe. So if it's expandable, that means that the pipe will actually expand out. Okay, like a rubber hose under pressure. Okay, like a, a, an actual, not like a garden hose, but something that actually expands. Okay, the expansion, is, the expansion is what we could call the magnetic field. Okay, so we have a closed pipe on one end, pump pumping this way, hydraulic pressure, so you can't pressurize the water. So the pipe is expandable, and the expansion of the pipe is our field. Okay, if the water could expand out in the rubber holes like a magnetic field, then that pipe would act like, oh, then that pipe would act just like a wire. Okay. Um, the field expands at 90 degrees from the pipe, right? So the pipe's going to try to expand, right, 90 degrees from the pressure, just like a magnetic field does. So it's in all directions, forcefully, right? But on the pipe, since it's just on the outside, it's going at 90 degrees, right, here. So that, that, makes, that matches our analogy for electricity. Okay, this field or pipe expands as the pressure increases. Less pressure... Uh, the slower the expansion. So it's still going to expand up until whatever pressure, but it's going to be slower if, the, if, it's, um, if it's less. So it's going to want to go out in this direction, right? So the less pressure, the slower the expansion, but it's going to always expand up until whatever the maximum pressure is. Okay, if we could pressurize it at higher pressure, it would expand faster, right? So more voltage right, more pressure. The more voltage would help. We only need a small amount of current to build the pressure. So a smaller pipe would expand faster with less flow. So let me, let me draw that out, because that's important. So let's draw two pipes. One is this big, one is this big. Now what we care about is the current aligns the atoms, and pressure pushes the pipe out, right? So flow, current, aligns the atoms. Pressure, or voltage, expands the pipe. So ask yourself, for the same amount of pressure, let's just draw pressure being in like a, we'll call it a dot. Pressure being a dot inside the pipe. If the pressure was a number drawn by the length of my arrow, Okay. We have this much pressure. We have the exact same amount of pressure here. All right, it's a little smaller, but same amount of pressure. Okay, this, this rubber hose is only gonna expand a little bit because you gotta remember, all of this is based on this pipe diameter, right? So here we only need a little bit of current and a lot of pressure to force the field out. Here we need a lot more current if we were gonna force the field out an equal distance, 
Make sense? If you didn't get that, go back and watch what I was saying. I said it very clearly. I don't want to repeat myself because this video is going to take a long time. We got, we got a lot to talk about. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to you. It's important that, I am going to repeat it. The bigger the pipe, the more current, the more flow you need to expand it out, right? But the smaller the pipe, right, the pressure, the voltage, can push it out a lot faster with only a tiny little bit of flow. Okay, and only one end of the flow, okay, and only one end of the flow, oh, and only one end of flow to make the pipe expand or to build the field on the pump side. Okay, so this is closed, right? So as the flow goes in, you only need flow here, not here, because this is a closed end, and you'll have the same amount of pressure throughout the entire system because it's a hydraulic. So you have force in all directions that are equal, expanding the pipe, just like a magnetic field does. So therefore, if we restrict the flow with a small wire or a small pipe, we can increase the pressure faster and the field or the pipe will expand faster. So the smaller the pipe, okay, let's look at this exact drawing. If we had another pipe right below this, okay, and this pipe, was only this big, and we only had a little bit of water in here, right? We could even, technically, we could even connect them to the same, same uh, pump if we wanted to. This little line is going to expand a lot more under the same pressure than this if we're talking about the same flow rate, right? Okay, so the more resistance, the better in this case, or the smaller the pipe, because the lower, oh, because it lowers the current or flow if we use more pressure or voltage. Making sense? So if we have a small pipe and the pressure is high, think about what happens when that pump stops abruptly, okay? If we have a small pipe and the pressure is high, think about what happens when that pump stops abruptly. Or if we had a very fast acting valve on the, on the pipe, okay, like a switch. In this case, we're, we're calling the switch the pump turning off really, really rapidly, right? Unlike AC, where it takes time to decelerate, we're saying, bam, off, okay? When that happens, there would be a pressure wave in the pipe right? Because the rapid change in the water's velocity, there's a massive press pressure surge that we see as a high voltage spike, also known as a transient spike, okay? The same thing as the water hatter, the same thing as the water hammer effect I was describing, okay? That field, that's the field collapsing, okay? That's that it's, it's got momentum, right, and it shuts off and it slams and it generates a shock wave in the system as a water hammer effect, okay? Just like the collapsing magnetic field. Okay, at this point, okay, we've had our high voltage spike or our pressure wave. However, all that pressure in the pipe wants to get back out, right? You've expanded this. Now it's under a high pressure and when you shut this pump off, right, if nothing's stopping this pump, it will want to come back out. And it comes back out in the opposite direction you put it in. EMF, back EMF. Got it? Okay. Is this making sense? This is a pretty cool water analogy in my opinion. The flow or the current also needs to come back out. That takes time. Just as it took time to build up the field, the more pressure, the faster the field builds up. The more voltage, the faster the, the field builds up. That might not be a 100% true statement, but in this analogy, it works. Okay, the more pressure, the faster the field builds up. What I mean is, you have a super high pressure, it's gonna wanna go in there and do its thing really, really fast. Where if you had a small pressure, it takes time to, to, to build up to the same expansion. If that makes sense. Okay, so this means that there are two things happening. One, the pressure wave. We call this the transient voltage spike. And the other is the flow, right, going backwards, that we call back EMF. 
Now think about if we had a pump pushing water in the pipe, just like this, with a closed end. There would be a force pushing back on the pump. With every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay? This is called counter-EMF, or C-EMF, also known as back-EMF, okay, or B-E-M-F, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is quite important. I'm saying, I don't like that black one, it's hard to get off. I'm saying, okay, when there's a pressure this way, there's an equal and opposite pressure pushing back on the pump. Okay, so this is EMF, and this is CEMF, or back EMF. Now what people think, including myself for a while, okay, is that the back EMF only happens after you turn the system off. That's an incorrect statement. All right, if we were to draw this on a graph, all right, I'll just draw a straight line as my graph. Okay, as voltage goes up, comes back down, let's make it a sinusoidal wave. There is exactly the same thing happening here. Okay. CEMF. Okay, and this is EMF. Now, what we think, right, we see this, we see this point of we put it all in, and then we get it all back, right? Well, we do get it all back. It comes back out. But this is happening. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, this is voltage here. Same thing happens here. So, back EMF is happening all the time. That's an important thing to know. So, the entire time the pump is running, there's an EMF. Not, oh, there's a back EMF. So, every, so, let me start over. So the entire time the pump is running, there's a back EMF. Not just after we stop the pump or the flow into the system. Okay, so at all times there's a back EMF. There's a counter force to the EMF or the, the force going in. However, everything that went in must come back out because it's a closed-ended pipe. And this takes time, but the rapid change in the water's velocity or the direction is where our pressure wave comes from. Also known as the back EMF spike, right? The voltage spike or the pressure wave in this, in this system. So there's more than one thing happening here, okay? That's what I'm trying to tell you. You don't just get back EMF because you shut it off. You get back EMF the entire time. You get back EMF current. But you also get this high voltage spike, and that high voltage spike comes from the velocity water change, that rapid change in acceleration. That's where you get that surge from. Okay, so there's two things happening. You could even isolate them if you want. Because you get back EMF even in a nice sinusoidal, but you don't get high voltage, right? However, if you somehow made an abrupt stop in this section, you would actually see, right, that you would get um, a voltage spike of some kind in this area, right? You'd actually see that. But here, if you just let it go, you don't see that. That's what, that's, this, this is what I'm trying to tell you. This also means that the more times you turn it on and off the pump, you create a surge every single time. So if you were to slam this pump on, on off, 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 on off. As you are pumping it, you generate surges inside this thing. You can do the same thing with electricity. Okay, so by turning on and off a coil rapidly, you generate a spike every time. Okay, and since we are using voltage or pressure, not current, that spike is very big. Okay, so the voltage spike comes from the rapid change in velocity, right, and you could argue this point, but what I'm telling you is, uh, is that every time you turn it on and off, every time, you get a surge. And the faster you shut it off and turn it back on, right, slam it, the bigger that surge is, the more intense that surge is. So this action also further restricts the current. 
As long as the field is changing, it's trying to restrict the flow or the current. Whew, that's the first section. Okay. So when you're pumping this thing and you're slamming it on and off, it's restricting the current flow. That's important. And every time you slam it on and off, you're creating those surges, those high voltage spikes in the electrical side of the system. Wow. That was deep. I thought about that for the last two days straight to figure this out. So I hope that makes sense. I think it's really cool that there's a back EMF or a counter EMF, right, C EMF, happening at all times, right? For a reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Not just after you turn the pump off is there back EMF. It's the entire time. So the voltage spike and the back EMF are isolated. Okay, this is a really cool way to explain it, in my opinion. Okay, oh, are we done? Oh, did I get these pages mixed up? Okay, uh, so let's talk about the wipe. Uh... Ah, no, no, we are on the right section. We're still talking about water, though, so you have to bear with me. Okay. Oh boy. So now, oh, yeah, my back does hurt. Oof. I'll get better though. This happens every once in a while. Pull a muscle. I just got out of bed too and just broke it. Okay, so we're gonna go back and we're gonna talk about the pipe, okay? Now we're gonna start working on the water analogy using elastic pipe in an inductor where you have a bunch of pipes wrapped together. Okay, so now let's think about what happens when we have a bunch of pipes in a coil, also known as an, as an inductor, such as a wire in a coil. Um, I'm going to draw a cross-sectional, okay? So I'm going to draw... Oh boy, I'm gonna draw it like this. So, so the form, right, this is like, this is like the core. In this case, it's just a form. And then you have the same, you have the same amount of wire over here, okay? So we just cut the thing in half. All right, so, if those pipes, right, this is this is going to be a small wire, small pipe, elastic pipe. So it's like literally a rubber pipe, like a latex hose or something wrapped around a core. And we're going to run water through it that's non-compressible, but with high pressure. So it expands the pipe. If those pipe were like a magnetic field, then they'd push on each other as they expanded, right? So right here. Um, we'd have pushing, right? We'd have these pushing on each other, and they'd all be pushing on each other. Okay, so the more pipes, the better. And the smaller the pipes, the better. Because the less flow, or current, right? Less current, less flow, can get through the pipe, uh, the better. The more turns the bigger the field for the same amount of flow or current. But the voltage can increase to get more expansion of the pipes. Okay, so since we're, just like earlier, since we're talking about a small... Battery died. Okay, so what I was saying was that um, the pipe is so small, okay, that you, can al you, you almost can't push any current through it or flow through it, volume through it. However, because it's hydraulic, right, I can use high voltage to expand these pipes rapidly with almost no current, right? So the field, right, or the pipe expansion, right, would come way out because each one of these is pushing on each other to build the expansion or the field, if you want to call it that. In this case, it's the expansion of the pipe. Okay, on the other hand, if we had a second coil, okay, and let's say we only had three turns of really big wire, right? This is like number 
40. And this is like number 18. And later we're gonna do the real math on this. So if we had, okay, this, for the same amount of flow or current, we get less of a field or less expansion of the pipe, right? So if we put a tiny bit of flow in here, but a huge amount of voltage, we could expand these out because they're hitting each other. And there's so many of them that the force forces it out, but we hardly put any current or flow into it. Here, we have to put a lot of flow into these, a lot of flow. And if we use the same amount of flow, you would barely even see a field here. You, you would literally barely see in a field. And you're gonna really understand this later once we do the math. But here is a really great analogy. It shows you physically how the field expands bigger here with little current, with high voltage, and, it, and barely expands here with even a lot more current because you only have this little bit of pushing action going on. Okay, this is so simple and so fundamental. You guys are gonna love this idea, I hope, because when I, when, I, when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, it makes perfect sense because you have a closed-ended pipe in this scenario to make it make sense, okay? However, the water analogy only goes so far. So for the next, uh, for the next parts in this video, they won't directly align with the rest of what I'm going to say. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. This is to give you a visual and you cannot directly imply the water versus the electricity. Okay, you just can't do it. But this gives you a really good visual for what we're gonna talk about next. Okay, because we are taught, uh, okay, I'll leave this up for a second. So, all right, because we are taught that current generates the magnetic field, we use big wire and lots of amps. But the truth is, you only need a small, oh boy, you only need a small amount of current, even in a big wire. This is where this doesn't quite match, okay? Let me read that again. Okay, we're moving on from the water. Okay, the water analogy worked for what I wanted to show you, but we're gonna move on. So I'm gonna erase this. All right. Because we are taught that current generates a magnetic field, we use big wire and lots of amps, but the truth is you only need a small amount of current, even in a big wire. Why? To align the atoms. That's all the current does is align the atoms. You don't need much to align atoms in a wire, even if it's big. After that, we can use voltage to expand the field, right? We can use pressure to push it out, okay? So this is where we're gonna strictly talk about wire and get rid of the water analogy, okay? What is a magnetic field? In the very beginning, we talked about this. It's the alignment of the atoms or the electron spin alignments, the magnetic moment, but we're not gonna get into that. Like I said, we're gonna keep it broad. So the alignment of the atoms, we're just calling the alignment of the atoms. You can align all the atoms in a big piece of wire with a very little bit of current. Then you can put voltage through it and make it expand. You'll, this will make sense later when we get to the math. Because current is what we say does the work most of the time, right? That's why we use a lot of current. However, it's better to use voltage instead. It's more in the pure potential side of the equation. And it allows us not to kill our dipole, as I've been saying, okay, or our source. So by using high voltage potential, it's harder to kill the dipole in the source, right? So if we have a high voltage battery, then a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of current, that battery is gonna do more for us than if we consume a bunch of the current, get the battery hot, and waste all the energy and heat. Make sense? I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't, go rewatch the beginning of this video, because this video is fundamental. This is even a better explanation of an open-ended coil, right? So everything I talked about and everything with the water analogy it really makes more sense for an open-ended coil. Because remember the rodent coil I talked about was open-ended, not connected to anything. Yet you can push everything into it, generate a magnetic field, watch it collapse and get it back out. Yet the other end isn't connected to anything. So tell me, does current flow through that inductor? I mean, seriously, does current flow through an inductor that's not connected to anything? 
right? I mean, how hard is that, right? If I've got the rodent coil, like I showed you, I'm getting a little off track. I wasn't going to talk about this, but it's so fundamental. So if I got a rodent coil like this, nothing is connected here, right? I can transfer power from this wire to this wire capacitively. Capacitively. But, right, I can get output here by putting input here. However, there's nothing here. So ask yourself, can current get through there? Now you know what I'm trying to say by a closed-ended pipe and an inductor. It does act that way even when you connect this side to a source, if it's configured correctly or the switching speed is fast enough. Everyone will argue that, and that's good. But listen to what I'm saying, because it does make sense. Oh, that black. Okay, this is good stuff, man. I hope everybody is enjoying this video because I'm very excited to make this one. So, let's talk about that switch closure idea, right? But let's talk about it using a long wire versus a short wire. Okay, the time changes dramatically. So how about an inductor? Does it also change the time? We just briefly touched on that. Now, I'm going to read you a bunch of stuff from an online source, and I will link this, and you can go read it yourself. Okay, all of these notes will be in the description. You can read through them. Um, I'll post it just like they are. If I made a mistake, I'll leave it in there. Um, and then note that I made a mistake, but I don't think I did. Okay, so quote from an online source that is trustworthy. I fact checked this. All right, this is what we now we're kind of getting back into electrical engineering. This is what they say. So we are te we are saying electrical engineering is going to agree with what I'm telling you right now. And you can do these calculations for yourself to make sure I'm right and to make sure you understand it. I say even if you're not good at it, go learn about a few of these things and you'll get what I'm trying to say because it's very important. Inductance Okay, L. I'm going to write it up here just so we have it. Inductance equals a big L. Okay. All right, so inductance is actually a measure of an inductor's resistance to the change of current flowing through the circuit. And the larger the value in Henry's, the slower the rate of current change. Okay, so, um, so L, right, is inductance, and Henry is what we measure it in. So as Henry's go up, right, as Henry's go up, the resistance, um, let's see, slower the rate of current change. I'm probably going to draw that wrong. I wasn't prepared to draw this. But anyway, basically, the bigger the inductance, right, the slower the rate of current change. So we're going to we're going to call this the rate of current change. Right, so the, as the inductance goes up, or the, the Henry's goes up, the rate of current change goes down. Okay, the slower the rate of current change. All right, another quote. The more atoms aligned, the more inductance it has. Uh, oh, now I think I'm missing a page. No, maybe not. Okay. The more atoms aligned, oh, this is my note, I think. The more atoms aligned, the more inductance it has, the more turns. Okay, the more turns, the more inductance as well. Okay, a quote from Wiki. In physics, imagine that, We're talking about physics. For all of you electrical engineers out there, your electrical engineer skills give you what you need to do what you need to do. But to do other things, we can look at physics, because... It makes more sense to me. In physics, the magnomotive force, okay? So we're going to write this up here. I'm going to erase this. Oh, geez. So 
M M F. Okay, is the mag magnet? Uh magnemotive magnemotive force. Okay, we're gonna need this a lot, so I'm writing these on the board so you have them. So in physics, the magnemotive force in the coil is I, okay, the electric current, so I, so current is I, uh, sometimes, uh, okay, so, oh, I went past that, I'm sorry, I went past what I was reading, so anyway, in physics, the magnetic force is a to my wife not to turn on the water heater. It'll be fine. In physics, the magnemotive force is a quality appearing in the equation for the magnetic flux in a magnetic circuit, sometimes known as Hopkins law, if I said that right. It is the property of a certain substance or phenomenon that give rise to a magnetic field or magnetic fields. So the equation all right, the equation looks like this. Um, so the motor, this, the uh, uh, MMF, right, is equal to N times I. Okay, N times I. And what is N, right? N The number of turns looks funny, but the number of turns is in, okay? And I is the electric current through the circuit. Sometimes the unit of Gilbert is used to express MMF, okay? So MMF is the magnemotive force, and it is equal to the number of turns times the current. That's what you're taught. Remember what I told you earlier? You don't need current to make a magnetic field. We're gonna do some fun stuff here, but we're gonna do it according to this law first. Okay, you ready to get to the math? Now, I did all these calculations, you fact check me. Okay, go do it. I used heavy build wire. I used the actual amount of copper weight, not with the insulation, okay? And I went and got the standards and did the math. According to my last video, I stated the question, what happens when we have a coil with the same amount of mass and it has the same magnetic field, okay? So it's the same magnetic field, the same amount of weight, and actually the same amount of input power, okay? What happens? Well, I did these calculations for real. So last time, okay, I used 100. I hope that's not too loud, it's probably not. So I used 100 pounds of copper. Is there two P's? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know why that looks funny. Can you guys read that okay? Ah, you'll be all right. Okay, so now I'm gonna do, okay, I'm gonna do 40. These markers are not doing well. Maybe it's because I'm leaving them open. So we're gonna do 40 and 18. And we're gonna compare these two. These are the same things I used last time. So the same. The same wattage. Okay. This is what we get. Now we're gonna change the coil size. Um, we did that because we want to match everything up and we're using the insulation so it changes things a little bit but they're pretty close okay i'm going to do this in millimeters and pounds and and ohms and and meters and milliamps and watts and turns and mmf and we're going to look at this real closely so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to write all this up on the board <clears throat> and inductance okay so i'm going to write all this up onto the board here we go i'm going to put the cap spec on these markers so they don't dry out 
Now I'm going to do this slowly. Strangely enough, I'm actually getting hot. Oh, my microphone's attached. Ah, we're actually getting pretty close to the, the end realistically here. We're going to talk about a little bit more though. Resist. My wife keeps turning the water heater on. Okay. So here we go. For 100 pounds, okay, this is going to be 18. I'm going to drill this a little bit, a little bit bigger. So for 18 AWG, okay, we're going to have a coil or a wall. Um, all right, it's going to look like this. This is what the coil looks like. Okay, so this is the width. Okay, this is I, it's the inner diameter. Okay, and this is the diameter of, of, of this. Okay, the width here. So the width, the tall, how, long, how tall it is, that's W, D, and I. Okay, we're going to need to know these parameters. All right, so I is equal to 109 millimeters. D is equal to 109 millimeters. Okay, and W is equal to 102 millimeters. All right, now later I use like thousands of millimeters, but we just use millimeters. <laughs> Okay, the wire length, uh, okay, wire L, wire length, all right, is 6,205 meters, okay? The resistance, okay, resistance, I didn't write all this up here, but uh, R is resistance, 130 ohms, okay, if we use a hundred volts, we're going to drop a hundred volts across the 130 ohms. So that's point, uh, oops, I'll let that drive for a bit off. Just makes a mess. Point, okay, 769 amps or seven hundred sixty-nine milliamps, okay. 77 watts. Okay, turns is equal to 9,024. Now, the MMF. So that's turns, the number of turns, right, times the amps. Okay, number of turns times amps, right here. Okay, gives us equal to 6,000. 946. Remember, this is the amount of magnetic field, basically. Total, mag total amount of magnetic field. Now, this is a rough calculation for the inductance, but we had to do rough calculation because these are getting big coils, and it's just a guesstimate. But they're close enough to give you an idea of what's going on. Right? So Henry's, um, which I took down earlier. So the Henry's is 22.5. Five. Okay, now we're going to write down the exact same information, but this information is going to be for what I used last time, right, which is 40. So, 40 AWG. Okay, uh, so the I is equal to the same, D is equal to 109, and the only thing we changed, millimeter, the width, okay, we changed, well, that, the width, we changed it to 152. And I had to do that just to make the numbers match for the amount of watts, the amount of pounds, and everything else. So don't forget, 100 pounds, copper, okay? Same amount of wattage. So let's look at what we got here, okay? The wire length. 
Okay, the wire length is equal to, <laughs> these numbers get, uh, they get big for this small wire. 1,000, I'm sorry, 1,049,000, 543 meters. That's a lot. Okay, resistance, right, is equal to 3 million... 691,637. What a difference. Now, in order to get the same amount of power, right, through this much resistance, we had to push 16,700 volts. That brings our amperage out to 0 0.0045 amps. Also the same thing as 4.5 uh, milliamps. How much watts? Do the math calculation, right? We get 75.55 watts. Same 100 pounds, same, well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to match the magnetic field strength. We gotta get down to it, so turns, is equal to 1,531,805. What is the MMF? Well, we wanted it to be the same. And it's pretty close. It's, it's uh, 6,929. Okay. Same watts. Pretty close. A little off, but it works out with my math good. And the MMF is pretty darn close. So, roughly calculating the inductance, right? Same magnetic field, same amount of power, same amount of copper. 22 Henrys. What do you think the Henrys is here? This is a rough guess. 647,000. 302 Henrys. So for the same amount of watts, just by switching out the wire, doing the calculation that we currently use, right, for the magnetic force, right, same amount, put my comma in there, we get this huge amount of difference in Henrys. Okay, now I wrote all this down and I brought this all up because I wanted to show you the real world numbers from last video. And we're going to do some more fun stuff using the real numbers here, okay? And you can, guys can check my facts, make sure I'm right if you want to do all this math. So, what does this mean, okay? So, we have to put... Uh, no, that must be a quote for some something else. Anyway, okay. Um, so here we go. So there's all your numbers. I'll try to get out of the way. So you can read them. So I'm going to read you another quote from online source. As the inductance of a coil is due to the magnetic flux around it, the stronger the magnetic flux for a given value of current, the greater will be the inductance. So a coil of many turns will have a higher inductance value than one with only a few turns. Therefore, the equation above will give the inductance L as being proportional to the number of turns squared. Well, there you go. So a coil of many turns will have a higher inductance value than one of only a few turns. 9,000 here. <laughs> Way too many here. One, uh, 1,531,805. So that's true statement. Okay, as well as increasing the number of coil turns, we can also increase the inductance by increasing the coil's diameter, or making the core bigger. In both cases, more wire is required to construct the coil, and therefore more lines of, of force exi exist to produce the required back EMF. Let me read that again, that's real important. Okay, if you increase the inductance, okay, more wire is required to construct the coil, and therefore more lines of force 
exist to produce the required back EMF. So what we're saying here, what they are saying, is that the more inductance you have, the more back EMF you have. Think about that for a while. I mean, this is something that we kind of know, but really to put it into proportions, I'm going to do some really interesting stuff here. So the, this is more quotes. No, this is mine. Oh yeah, I just re, 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 I'll read this anyway. So the more inductance, the more back EMF. However, in our cool coil here, we use the same power and we use the same amount of copper and we got a massive increase in inductance for the same magnetic field. Same power, same amount of copper, same magnetic field, bigger inductance. So for the same amount of input power, we got a lot more back EMF. So we got a lot more back EMF here for here, even though the magnetic field is the same, right? The watts are the same, yeah? Everything, the, the weight is the same. We get more back EMF because we have a huge inductance versus that one, according to these calculations, which I've done three times now to make sure I was right. <laughs> this is using current known teaching. All right, another quote. If the inner core is made of some ferromagnetic material, such as soft iron, cobalt, or nickel, the inductance of the coil would greatly increase. Because for the same amount of current flowing in the magnetic, uh, for the same amount of current flow in the magnetic flux generated would be much stronger. Let me read that again. If the inner core is made of some ferromagnetic material, such as soft iron, cobalt, or nickel, the inductance of the coil would greatly increase because for the same amount of current flow in the magnetic flux generated would be much stronger. That quote reads a bit funny. But basically, for the same amount of current flow, the greater amount of inductance, the bigger the field is. We just proved that here. Okay, so what happens if we add magnets to the core? Is that made of mm, iron or cobalt or nickel? Maybe. Neodymium? So by adding, by adding magnets inside of our coil, by putting them in here, you can actually make the inductance even bigger. And the idea would be to use the magnets to do some work, right? Spin the magnets in the coil. Use the coil to spin the magnets. Also increases the inductance, which helps you out in other things. Okay, what I'm about to say is in a hundred percent correlation to the current understanding. Yet some people will just blindly disagree. Yet you can go do the math for yourself and you'll just totally disagree with what I'm going to tell you right now. Hear the crookets? Yeah, those are real. Those aren't added. What I'm about to tell you is 100% in correlation with the current mathematics, and yet people can't see it. They won't, they'll just disagree with this. Kind of like you may have already done here. All right, another quote, another quote. Hey, we're only down to like five pages. A lot of math coming. Quote, inductors are made from individual loops of wire combined to produce a coil and if the number of loops within the coil are increased, then for the same amount of current flowing through the coil, the magnetic flux will also increase. Let me read it again, and I'll write some of my own words in here. Inductors are made from individual loops of wire combined to produce a coil. And if the number of loops within the coil are increased, then for the same amount of current flowing through the coil, the entire coil, the magnetic flux will also increase. Hmm, same amount of current. What did we change? Just the number of turns. What did we get out of that? The magne magnetic field will increase. Let me say it again. All we're doing is adding turns. Didn't change the current. Magnetic flux increases. Now, to get the same amount of current through a small wire, you'd have to boost the voltage. But if you do the math, you'll see some pretty cool stuff. But for now, just remember that. The more turns, it increases the magnetic flux with the same amount of current.
Now things get really interesting, I wrote on this paper. Now, before I erase this, um, you guys should write a few of these numbers down so you have them to compare against my next coils. So again, we fixed the copper, we fixed the power, we used two different wires, we used the same magnetic flux, and we got a huge inductance. And what did I just read? Okay, the more it turns, with the same amount of current flowing, which we actually have a different amount of current, but we have a total amount of watts, the magnetic flux will increase. Okay, so we did the equation backwards here. Now we're going to do it by keeping the current the same. Okay. It's so funny that people are going to just totally blindly ignore this, that are, that say this kind of work can't be done or whatever. They're just going to blindly ignore what I'm about to tell them. It really makes me laugh. All right, now we're going to look at a coil with a fixed resistance. Now we're going to fix the resistance. See, earlier we changed the resistance. Now we're going to fix it. Okay? R is always going to equal 10,000 ohms. That's a pretty large number. Now, we're also going to fix the voltage, and we're going to fix the amperage. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to fix the voltage, which will fix the amperage. So, the voltage is always going to be 1,000 volts. Okay, uh, therefore, I didn't write, oh yeah, I did, okay. The current is going to be 0.1 amps. Or, I'm writing it in milliamps and amps because that always confused me as a newbie. Now we're, we're going to do the opposite equation. We're going to fix the resistance. We're going to say the voltage is always 1,000. And we're going to say the current's always the same, 100 milliamps. So it's 100 watts. We're never going to change that. Now let's use the same equations up here to do the same thing. This is going to be fun. Okay. Now, don't forget, we're going to have to increase the coil size dramatically. So with that said, I'm going to start writing. Um, okay, so this is, uh, let me just draw this like this. So the first coil, and I'll get out of the way in a second. Um, this is number 44. 44 wire coil is about that big. Okay? Smaller than that even. Okay, I, for that I over there, 10 millimeter. D is equal to 10 millimeter. And W is equal to 8.6. Right? There's a point right there. 8.6 millimeter. It's a little bitty tiny coil. It's only about that big. But, 44 AWG, right, it's all AWG wire, American wire gauge, okay, it will be 10,000 ohms, however, the weight is only 0 .048 of a pound, it's a tiny little bitty thing, the wire length the wire length is equal to 1,200 meters. 1,200 meters on a coil, that, 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 that's, that's crazy. That's a lot of wire. How many turns do you think we are? Okay, the turns is 19,158. If you've never seen 44 wire, it's pretty small. Now, okay, um, Earlier, I did not mention this. I need to mention this. Uh, so this is also equal to amp turns. Right? Because it is amps times turns. So we call it amp turns. It's not divided by. It's just called amp turns. Okay. So the MMF, right, or amp turns, is equal to 
1,881. So 1,881. And the Henry's is equal to 9.2. Nine. Looking at this right now, again, that Henry looks really big. So that number might be wrong. I hope these numbers are right. I did a lot of math. Okay. Now, if we use the same amount of current, <laughs> except we're going to use a wire that's going to be a lot bigger. Like a lot bigger. You ready for this? Okay. So we're going to draw a line here. All right, so two two AWG, okay, two AWG, two. That's big. Okay, the coil is going to be huge, but we want the same amount of current, right? We want to make sure we stick with 100 milliamps through two AWG at a thousand volts, right? So the coil. I is equal to 12,000, right? And I could do meters, but I'm just going to leave it as millimeters. Millimeters. D is 13,000 millimeters. And W isn't so big. It's 860. 860 millimeters. Okay. R, still 10,000 ohms. <laughs> now we're going to do the pounds. Here we had 0 0.048. Okay. Here we have <laughs> 12 million. 916,845. That's a big coil. Somebody tell me how many tons that is. We're just proving a point using their math. The length. Um, the wire length is 119,000. 372 meters, okay? Turns, you thought 19,000 was a lot. 2 AWG, that would be 249,798 turns. Holy crap, okay. And then, MMF, or amp turns, okay? This is how you normally do calculations. All right, it's 24,826. How many Henrys do you think it is? <laughs> Two million. <laughs> 105,107. Remember, the more the Henrys, the bigger the field. Now, we did this calculation according to amp turns. Because we fixed the amps, and we said all we're going to do is change the turns. Now, we had to change the coil size because the wire got huge. But we changed the turns. We went from 19,000 something up to 249,000, 250,000 turns. And look at what happened to our MMF. It went way up. Inductance went way up. What happens when inductance goes up? For 100 milliamps input at 1,000 volts in this coil, you're going to get this much flux. What happens to the back EMF? Remember, back EMF goes up. This is using their math. I'm using their math. So now, okay, we're going to do the reverse calculation. Let's see how much power it will take to generate the same MMF, okay, with number two wire when we're using the amp turns to calculate power required. So what we're going to try to do right now is we're going to try to match 
Okay, we're gonna do a reverse calculation. We're gonna try to match, that's the same color. Uh, we're gonna try to match this, right, by changing the amp turn ratio. So we're gonna change the amps, and we're gonna change the volts, and we're gonna try to match the MMF with number two wire, and we're gonna see how that goes. Because what I'm saying is I wanna generate a field this big, but I wanna use two AWG. I don't care about the power. Let's find out what happens. All right, so using amp turns, okay, what we want, right, in amp turns is 1881. MMF, that's what we want. Okay. So in order to do that, um, in number 2, 2 AWG, okay. I hope I wrote that down right. Okay, I think I did. It will take a thousand volts. Okay. <laughs> How many amps do you think I need? Okay. How many amps do you think I need? Well, I need oh, five thousand. 893 amps. Yeah, how many watts is that? Well, that's 5,893,000 watts. Holy crap. Resistance is going to be equal to 0.17 ohms. Okay. Okay, the wire length is going to be equal to only 330 meters. And the turns is only going to equal 317 turns. Now, how piddly is that? Now, if you want to know the coil diameter and stuff, okay, the I for that up there is only 165. Oh, did I write? I think I wrote down the pounds on the next one. Okay, so 165. 165. 86. Okay. Millimeters. So how many pounds is that? Well, it's only... Only 217 pounds. And the Henry's equals 0 0.04. 0 0.04. Here we have this number. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Now, realistically, you could do these numbers a little more realistically. I went to the extreme because I was trying to match 10,000 ohms. But here, I didn't care about the amperage, right? And the ohms is only 0 0.7, 0 0.17, right? And look how many watts we need. Now, maybe... Maybe, for a really short amount of time, you could dump that much power through a capacitor. Maybe you could do that. And a matter of fact, even my magnetizer, my magnetizer at work, or works magnetizer, it runs between uh, 0 and 3,000 volts, and you can actually push 5,000 amps into the system. So technically, I could build this coil, check the MMF, and see if it matches. And I bet it would. You, you, there's a lot of power to magnetize magnets, okay? Oh, now, uh, we have two pages left. Now, this is using known mathematics. What does it say? Okay, what does all this really, really mean? It means if you increase the inductance, I mean the Henry's, the inductance, while decreasing the power input, you will generate more back EMF. Right? So if you increase the inductance, right, also H for Henry's of inductance, while decreasing the input power, here we kept the power identical, so we didn't even change it. We're only using 100 milliamps, 100 watts. That's it, 100 watts to generate a field, right? If you, if you increase the inductance, the power input, if you try to decrease it or leave it the same, you'll generate a large back EMF. So the idea is to use the lowest amount of current for the biggest inductance and you'll get the biggest back EMF.
is proportional to these measurements, to this calculations that aren't made up. This is like what we currently use. The more atoms, right? The more, remember, the more atoms you can align with the lowest amount of current possible, the more back EMF will be in a coil like this. When you have a coil that is massive, huge, with a huge amount of turns, it actually starts acting more like a capacitor. So that's something to think about. It also means, okay, all right, so this is the next thing. So that's that. Back EMF goes up. That's the whole point. Back EMF goes up with more, induct with more inductance with the same amount of input power. Okay, lower back EMF, higher back EMF. Okay, so you can think about the pipe analogy, right? The more pipes, the more small pipes you have, okay, the more you can push it out. Now here, right, like I said, it doesn't quite match that in the analogy of the water pipe. But when you look at it mathematically, it all matches up just fine. And that means more back EMF. So for 100 watts, do you have any idea how much back EMF you could get off of a coil that has two million Henry's. That's ridiculous for a hundred watt input. And you're generating a magnetic field that's this big. <laughs> what? Now who builds a coil, right? That weighs 12 million pounds. But you don't have to go that extreme. Okay. Um. All right, now we're gonna talk about the heat thing. I kind of brought this up, but any heat that you generate is wasted. This proves the point that you only need 100 milliamps in a coil this big at 1,000 volts to generate this big of a field. Mathematically, this is what it says. So that means this coil is not gonna get hot. It's just not. You know way you're gonna heat up a coil that weighs 12 million pounds with 100 watts. Sorry, it ain't happening. So what does that mean? That means current isn't the thing that makes the magnetic field here. This is proving that to you. 100 milliamps in this big of a coil and you're saying this big of... No, current isn't what's doing it. Current aligns the atoms. Voltage pushes it out. Even in a wire that big. Okay. So if you go the other route, right? When you heat something, you disalign the atoms. When you do this, you have to put more power into it, right? To counteract the fact that you're disaligning atoms by generating heat. So therefore you put more into it. And more alignment equals more magnetic output. So the colder you can keep it like a superconductor, the more magnetic field you generate. Is that not true? Of course it is. Okay, if you keep it cold, you can push small amounts of power into the coil and get a much bigger outcome. You can, you can get up to 100% with no losses. Last page. This is where our electrical losses come from, heat and current. We don't need much current to make a magnetic field. And the bigger the field, the bigger the back EMF. That's the bottom line. Lower the current, lower the input, bigger the inductance, bigger the field, bigger the back EMF. So at some point, at some point in these calculations, you hit a critical mass, so to speak. You hit a critical mass where you overcome the input power by a greater amount of back EMF. These calculations prove it.
Now someone needs to sit down and do back EMF calculations of this type of coil and make sure 100% to prove mathematically that it works. I haven't done the back EMF calculations, I'm just going by what an inductor is doing and supposed to do. Okay, I'm not here to prove anything to you. I'm not here to prove anything. I'm only here to show you the facts. I will never prove anything to you. You have to convince yourself of the truth. <sighs> Yay, I didn't run out of battery. Seriously, that was a really long presentation, but to be honest with you, it's probably the most fundamental thing because it's not my mathematics and it works. It's proof of concept mathematically and it works. And that's it. That's the end of the story. More copper. Less amount of current you need to align the same amount of atoms. Bigger the field you generate, the bigger the Henry's the coil is. You can use that magnetic field to rotate a rotor. And you also get a bigger back EMF. <sighs> okay. My back hurts. My voice is tired. And it is currently 11. Eleven oh eight p.m. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry that this had to take so long, but I had to get through it and I had to give you the real numbers. And again, I will post all of this in the description so you can have it and you can reference it. You can use it for what you want. I might make a PDF, actually, probably a good idea. And um, and yeah, that's it. God bless you guys. Read the Bible more. It really will help you in the time of need or in the time of searching for knowledge. And just think about what I told you in this video. God bless you guys. Have a good day. That was a really long video. Signing out. If you haven't watched the other videos, make sure you go watch them. Okay, I'm still here.